Welcome to the Oxford Berlin Creative Collaborations Podcast. Today we are in conversation with the experimental film and media art class at the University of the Arts in Berlin, led by Professor Nina Fischer. We are focusing on new forms of research in the field, Art in the Age of Climate Change. In this three-part series, we showcase research projects across the arts and humanities, drawing on expertise from the University of Oxford and University of Arts in Berlin, on methodologies from the humanities as well as artistic expression. We will be exploring how art can work with sensory knowledge beyond the human world. In doing so, we will experiment with thought processes that can move away from the forms of society imposed by post-colonial and imperialistic social norms. Our speaker today is Eiko Soga, who is currently doing her PhD at the Ruskin School of Art in Oxford. Eiko is currently working with an ethnic group in Japan called the Aine. She is producing a book and video work of her experience learning traditional Aine cooking in the town of Samani in Hokkaido, Japan. As an introduction, we warmly welcome historian Amanda Power of the University of Oxford. She will talk about the network climate crisis thinking in the humanities and social science, also presenting our collaborative conversations on the climate crisis and MLIs on the planet. Thank you very much. So I, I thought I'd say a little bit about the climate crisis thinking in the humanities and social sciences network, which was launched officially in Oxford um, about this time last year, but we'd been working towards it for a, a little while um, in a slightly smaller group of people. So it, the two of us who began to think this was necessary, um, Naina Kamatha, who unfortunately isn't here today, who's, a, who's an anthropologist working on human big cat relations. And I am a medieval historian working on I suppose the medieval background to the Anthropocene situation, so the cultural and political and intellectual structures that lead us to think about the, the world in the way that we do and, and as a sort of attempt to explain why it's so difficult for us to react to, to the scientific information that we have about the impact of our way of living on the planet. Um, I, I see that as being something that extends very far back into the human past and it's connected perhaps with the, the earlier states, but developed quite intensively in medieval Europe especially. So Nanako and I began talking together about how our two disciplines should be in contact over questions of the Anthropocene because we both have the concept of the Anthropocene in our research and we got in touch with some people working in climate science and geography who are members of the IPCC panels and so have a strong sort of sense of how this is all working politically as well as scientifically and so we took it from there and that the objective of the network as it emerged and gathered people from different disciplines was to try and first put humanities and social sciences disciplines into conversation with each other about how we might best bring our disciplines into larger global conversations about climate crisis and all the related environmental questions that they bring up and the feeling that we've arrived at quite I suppose quite strongly and in a quite clear cut way as these conversations have gone on is that problem of climate crisis has been treated so much in the sciences as a problem that has solutions that's a, a matter for scientists and policymakers, but perhaps not for people in other disciplines to contribute to. And the, the irony of this, of course, is that scientists have demonstrated very comprehensively that climate crisis isn't caused by humans, it's anthropogenic. So the idea that you would tackle a human caused problem by ignoring humanities and arts and social sciences is absolutely insane as far as I can see. It's excluding from discussions of solutions most of the causes. So with this sort of fairly fierce assessment of current approaches to climate crisis in, in mind, we've been trying to develop both ways of talking amongst our, ourselves in the disciplines to develop much more sort of creative ways of, and I suppose more appropriate ways of thinking about the human problem of climate change, but also increasingly we're, we're reaching out to science, uh, to, to people working in the sciences and to more public audiences as a way of trying to communicate what we see as being perhaps 
the way forward for tackling climate crisis. Um, so both an intellectual project and a project connected with, with many surrounding disciplines, and then also increasingly a public facing project. And this is why we're so excited about the collaboration with Udika, because of, of the capacity to communicate in very fresh, exciting ways through the arts. Um, so I think is that a useful background? I think that's where, you know, where we come in and why we're so delighted to be talking to all of you here today. I say also hello to everybody and to ACO. Welcome to our class. First of all, I would like to introduce our guest today, the artist and researcher Eko Soga. Her works result in various media like installation, essay and moving image. Eko will talk today about her research and present her film Ainu Hunter, Monchan. Very nice to meet you all. Um, I'm very excited and honored to join this discussion. And I'm very excited to talk about my experiences in Hokkaido, Japan, where I am currently based. I'm in my third year of PhD at Ruskin School of Art in Oxford. As part of my research, I'm doing my field work, which I started in September this year, and I probably finish it in June next year. So it's a almost one year field work. With my PhD, I'm exploring how an art can embody felt knowledge of more than human world. In particular, I'm working with an Ainu community in a town called Samani in Hokkaido. I'm using a film camera and a digital film camera and photographic camera and creative writing to collect moments when I encounter reciprocal empathy and when those moments lead to unpacking of interrelationship between culture, nature and people. My overall aim of the research is to participate in conversations such as reforestation and decolonization. I also hope that the process of my research can move away from society and education that developed through post-colonial and imperialistic social norms. I like to briefly mention about the Ainu history and their culture, as this will kind of the uh, foundation of our conversation later. Then I will show you the video work which I made. In, I finished making it this year. The video is a result of my interaction with people in Hokkaido between 2015 and 2019. I will then talk a little bit more about my research. And lastly, I'd like to have open conversation with you all. And I must say I am Japanese, born in Tokyo. I spent more than half of my life in England, but still I'm not, uh, and I'm not Ainu, so I feel quite hesitant to talk about it. And so please don't take it as I, I'm, I'm not representing the Ainu, but I'm just talking about the history to just give you a brief idea. So the Ainu are believed to have inhabited northern part of what we now call Japan and Saharan island of Russia. And they had their own distinctive culture, language, social system, and they developed their culture based around cycle of nature and belief that almost everything we see in the world, Kamui, which is an Ainu word. And yes, so a word Kamui means spiritual or divine beings, or some people translate the word as gods, and they are everywhere. I won't go into details of what this word actually means because I can spend an hours and hours about it. Anyhow, at the end of 19th century, Ainu and Hokkaido were colonized by Japanese. And since then, Ainu people had to leave behind their culture and live as Japanese. So everyone now are Japanese, but very small group of people are working hard to get their culture back. And more recently, there are some Ainu people who are trying to get their language back, so which includes learning language and so on. And the more I learned about the Ainu culture and their history, more I learned the importance of understanding decolonization and learn diversity of both people and nature. This process also became relearning of my social norms and prejudice. Echo, thanks for sharing your movie. 
and I found out that um, I could still understand some part of the Japanese, which was quite nice. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was also thinking back to our time in uh, Hokkaido, when we were also walking a lot um, in the nature and in the mountains, which is very beautiful. Of course, we also came across the Ainu culture. There was a musician, his name was Oki. He was still uh, practicing Aino music. And he also told us that he came as uh, an old lady. And in that time, he, she had been like the only, the last one who's a really native um, Aino speaker. And I was very impressed, but also very sad somehow to hear that it's there's few people still speaking that language. And of course, um, yeah, so far I also know... Um, about the culture and how it's treated it took a really long time until the Ainu culture was somehow, let's say, rediscovered also by governmental institutions and to build a museum and different facilities. But there was a really huge gap in between the time when the Ainu culture was still lived until it was uh, re rediscovered is maybe not the right uh, English term for it, but until it came back into consciousness and uh, people really cared more about it. And I think today, um, also thanks to researchers and artists and also people in mostly in Hokkaido who are also um, dealing or working with nature, I think it really came back into consciousness a little bit more. But as we can also see, uh, when we listen to this uh, hunter, there's already a, a lot of knowledge also lost. But it's really great to see that people like him traces and try to um, get it back to life and also live this culture. That, uh, of course, you have to uh, negotiate and to talk with the spirits if you want to get a, have a good relationship also with the animals and the nature. That it's not just given. Thank you so much for your feedback. It's really nice to hear. <laughs> Yeah, he's so amazing. He's one of the kindest person I've met in my life. Um, I met lots of nice people, but he's just extraordinary. And as far as I know, he's the only Ain hunter around now, you know, in contemporary society. Maybe I should talk about what Ain hunter means and how that is different to ordinary hunters, because mm -hmm. we do have Japanese hunters who hunt deer and bear. The difference is, is um, as Monchan said in a film, he prays and he, the way he engages with the space in the mountain and his inner sense is just like practiced on a daily basis. And, you know, even he hunts and eats meat and use every part to not waste any bit of the deer. Whereas ordinary hunter can just go in, as long as they have license to use rifles, they can hunt under the name of wild, wildlife management without any respect. I'm currently working with 78 years old Aino lady called Mrs. Kumagai, and she, her father was the last Aino hunter in the town where I'm living now. This meant Ainu had the ritual ceremonies called Iomante, which included days and days of carving woods and preparing food, making alcohol, just to celebrate and appreciate animals. And with, in particular with bear, it was one of the biggest ceremony. And it included, yeah, as I said, preparation, but also dancing, singing, cooking, and eating food together. It did involve killing a baby bear. And so, you know, when the Japanese influence came to Kaido, it was uh, largely criticized saying how cruel it is to raise, to kill a baby bear. But in fact, they raise a baby for a year too, more preciously than sometimes more preciously than human babies. So it really confused me, like how, how could people raise a baby more, you know, so preciously and kill it? So I asked Mrs. Kumagai what it meant. And she said, we were sending the Kamui back. And I was like, I still don't understand. <laughs> and she said, there aren't any other way to describe it. But I know outsider hates it. 
but we are sending the spirit back where the gods belong. And this was something I really didn't, like, I could kind of rationalize it in my head, but also felt I didn't understand it. So when I met a local hunter, I asked if I could see see a deer getting dissected because it was happening anyway as part of wildlife management and one day he called me around seven in the morning and said i got a bear come over and i had to jump out of my bed get ready pack all my camera in my bag and run to this place and i saw this 400 kilo a child bear still big quite huge and I saw the whole process of this bear getting dissected. When I imagined it, I always imagined something nasty and uh, maybe gross or something really painful. But when I saw it, it was the most beautiful thing. When the body was cut or the intestine came out, it was full of fat and food inside. The bear's stomach was it's a child, but the size of stomach was a size of my upper body, packed with food. And the intestine was huge and, yeah, also, you know, packed. And layers of layers of fat between muscles. And it felt like, I felt like I was seeing a magic of nature. And uh, anyhow, I went home in the evening and uh, but I couldn't sleep. I felt like I was kind of covered with the spirit of bear and I was both very very grateful to the bear but also very sad and until I fell asleep um, maybe like 3 a.m I was like praying in my head that this bear is resting in peace and I'm not religious so I was so surprised with myself I had such sense of prayer <laughs> And this experience gave me insight into what Ainu hunting might mean, that they really spend so much effort to practice the appreciation and respect towards nature and animals. So that was very, very important. But because I, I, I really don't want to criticize those hunters who gave me opportunity to see this dissecting moment, but they really treated animals like objects and a source of money. So I was very upset and it gave me a question of why I knew way was criticized. But because those hunters are not breaking the law, it's okay. It's not right. <laughs> the, the body parts that didn't become money was thrown away into the mountain whereas I know people used everything every part of the body and it was their survival to you know to survive this very cold winter um, they needed far meat and so on it was very important for me to understand it to also kind of revisit my conversation with Monchan yeah thanks and you Sorry. said you uh, you got out of your bed you grabbed your camera and you went there so the question would be, finally, did you film it or did you just watch it? Because I can imagine that it's also difficult in that moment to think about the camera, but I would rather maybe think I will watch it and leave the technique uh, in my car. I don't know. So how was your experience? It was very important for me to figure out my relationship with camera mm -hmm. and my relationship with bear. So what I did was to just place a camera on tripod and leave it just on the same spot. And maybe I changed the spot of tripod like three to five times uh, whenever there was a moment to look away um, from a bear. Or if those men were taking break for a minute, I would just move the camera. Yeah, thanks for your explanation. I think um, it's really interesting um, how your method of learning by actually filming is kind of, it's so nice, like what you said, learning by doing, let's say, it's the same what Manchao is doing by practicing in the woods. 
and getting to know a, like a, a knowledge that you cannot read or that you cannot receive by reading. And I find it interesting that it's the same for you with camera. And um, I also experience the same thing that when I film, it's kind of quite an intuitive thing, something that's just happening. And then in editing, I always feel like, ah, that's where I understand the whole process often. So I would really would like to know more about this method. Yes, for me, I learn most through practicing and doing or making. And uh, this mountain work came out quite unexpectedly, actually, because my main mission of going to this town, uh, I was in this town where mountain lives in two 2015 and 2016, about three months since 2016, to learn how to make uh, Aino kimono uh, made out of salmon skin, which in the end really didn't happen. But I ended up making a kimono, which meant I spent a lot of time with local women and spent a lot of time together in silence. But sometimes, you know, we gossip and I hear all the anecdotes. And so I learned their culture through these small gestures and small talks, which was really interesting because that's not what get written in the books or in the museums. And because I was there for three months, I became friends with Monchan and we used to go fishing, going for walks, Monchan and his friends. And I spent a lot of time talking about, you know, issues that makes Ayn practice difficult. Finally, in 2019, I had an opportunity to see Monchan going on hunt. And so it's not just making, but also developing friendship and kind of encountering right moment and don't miss it. <laughs> Sometimes I must be missing special moments. But the thing about camera is when I encounter something special, sometimes I don't have a camera, then what do I do? And uh, sometimes having a camera isn't appropriate. It can be rude. And often with Ainu people, they have history of, you know, outsider being inappropriate and photograph them as if they're objects. So, you know, it's a very sensitive thing to deal with cameras. But yeah, learning through making really takes me to unexpected place. So I enjoy that a lot. Um, it's almost like unspoken navigation of my research and process. Many thanks for listening to our work. We hope you found it stimulating and that you will subscribe for more thought-provoking work from artists and researchers working in Oxford and Berlin.